Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and I'm very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show on the subject of the day. We're all dealing with, across the planet, the subject of COVID-19, this viral strain that is wreaking havoc everywhere. And people are up in arms here, there, and everywhere across the world. And what's interesting is that even though numbers tend to be going up in many places, especially in the United States still at this point, and New York in particular, as well as, of course, Louisiana, soon in Florida, a bit in Georgia, and on and on and on, there are also some remedies in our midst, and there are ways of handling ourselves in our midst, some of which are being communicated through network TV, but some are not. And explanations are also few and far between. And with this being the case, I have invited to join us today Dr. Gordon Chu, who is an expert on viruses. He's been through uh, viral outbreaks before. He has a relationship, well, of course, with the United States, but also with China and other parts of the world where he has been a consultant and an advisor and an expert on viral conditions and outbreaks. He'll be uh, joining us today. A few words about him because he's a truly extraordinary gentleman who uh, spoke to me recently and I was so impressed with uh, what his accomplishments are at a very early age, one of those prodigies you could say. And uh, he's a scientist, he's a teacher, he's an inventor, he's an author. Uh, he speaks several languages and uh, He's got a background in naturopathic medicine as well. He has filed over 27 patents. He's worked in the corporate world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, pharmaceutical, and yet has the larger holistic perspective that we so much appreciate here at A Better World. And uh, so it's a real pleasure to bring him on today, and I want you to understand a lot of what he has to share. He's been sharing it worldwide now, and now he'll be sharing it with our A Better World audience. So, Dr. Chu, welcome to A Better world a pleasure to have you hi Mitchell I'm glad to be on the show Good with you were there it's a pleasure it's a pleasure so you know dr. Chu you have done so much work in the space as I was describing before of virology in a sense uh, without maybe being considered one formally but you've come up with uh, explanations of certain methods that we, uh, everyone, really could use. I'd love for you to expound on those, as well as let's talk about natural remedies as well, which are getting no press anywhere except for here at A Better World and a few other choice so-called alternative media spots. And uh, this is a forum for you to really share with us you know, your deep knowledge about this and the kind of guidance I think we could all benefit from, from your deep knowledge, and uh, this could lead to really saving lives. So please share with us, and we'll go from there. Well, the virus, uh, you know, first of all, these viruses um, will, um, 10 years ago, when I was on the forefront of the H1N1 crisis um, within the United States, uh, we, we saw a pandemic, um, but fortunately, the pandemic was snuffed out um, because we just didn't allow it to get out of hand. Uh, one, one very important um, distinction is to understand that these viruses that keep showing up, MERS, SARS, um, the H1N1, they're all attacking our respiratory system um, and the coronavirus uh, which in full expression, once you get the disease, is COVID-19, um, there is no difference. It also attacks the respiratory system, and people are complaining. They're having tight chest. Um, they're having conditions where um, the lungs are being filled up with mucus, and they're having a hard time to breathe, shortness of breath. So the symptoms um, have similarities with many things that lead to shortness of breath. Um, but, the, but the virus... Fortunately for us, an encapsulated, the non-naked virus, and because it's non-naked, 
it contains the morphology. Well, what does that mean, spikes. non-naked? Well, it has a it has a capsule around it. It has a okay. it almost like if you were to drive around, and if you drive around naked, meaning not without clothing, but if you're driving mm-hmm. naked, it would mean perhaps that your your windows could be see through, or you don't have windows. Some kind of protection that gives you an outer oh, shell. Okay. So. Yes. Right. So let's say if your car. So they, in other words, they're things. encapsulated. You're saying. You yes, know, encapsulated. Encapsulated way. with okay. what is the detail? It's very important. It's yeah. encapsulated That's the important with, thing. with a, a, a. It's a lipid encapsulation, so it's fatty. So, um, but it also has spikes, and the spikes are not fatty. They're they're glycoproteins. Um, they're which spiky. that means is it's a. Yeah, they're spiky, and these <laughs> spikes um, attach to these cells, uh, human cells. And then the virus, which is an RNA, single-stranded RNA virus, is it's able to inject the RNA into our cells. And the first cells that they usually see, because we breathe it in, are the cells in our lungs. And yes. when it does that, it does one thing, and it knows to do that one thing, which is to put the RNA inside of your cells and to control them. One virus could make... 10,000, for example, viruses. And the numbers are just in general. These are generally speaking numbers. And those 10,000 yeah. viruses that pop and burst out of the cell, the cell is now rendered useless, um, will infect, each virus will infect another cell. And there's a, um, a amount of time that occurs for this to happen. And, we're, and every virus has a different type of speed and, and, and ability to do that. And once it's in you... So this is in the um, sense... Gordon, what creates the lethality? This is why they are so fatal to a certain number of people because essentially their respiratory system is being attacked. The virus is multiplying geometrically, and a person's cells just don't really stand a chance against that. Is that a correct understanding? Exactly. Exponentially, it is just growing exactly what you said geometrically. So it's not an arithmetic increase. It's an exponential right. geometric increase. Yes, um, yes. And so that is, that's a problem. So when you cough and say you have a viral load, how many viruses did you cough out is almost irrelevant because there's a lot. Let's just use uh, many, right? There's a lot of viruses. Yeah, in a sense, you're out. saying that even if there's one, it's a lot. Right. Is right. That, one is too many. One yeah, virus one is, is too, too many. many. Right. Yes, one Correct. is too many. Now, yeah. now the chance of – and I'd like people to think of sperm, right? So when you're having um, – mm-hmm. when you have um, sperm meeting the egg, how many sperm meet the egg? Well, you don't send in one. You send in many, right? So the virus mm-hmm. thinks like that, right? If it, if it had a mind, you'd say mm-hmm. it has this very strategic programming to release as many viruses as possible so that it can land on one cell to then infect the cell and then Just subsequently like landing on that one viruses. egg, right? Right. It's like one finding egg, that one, one egg. Right. Yeah. How many sperm? Billions, right? So same as hell. Mm-hmm. Billions of viruses get released when someone coughs and you know and, and, and multiple people put on multiple people are infected now. So yeah. so the magnitude of this and that's a lot of momentum, right? So the human beings are very special. We are a very special species. We write down all of our information. And we have the Internet. We have books. We teach our children. And we're described as a K-type species because it takes a lot of time to bring up one human individual. But we're very powerful. So why are, is it so hopeful? Is because we've written down many, many things over the years. Now, we have some flaws because we argue amongst each other, and we're, the, and we're a species that ponders, what am I going to do yes. next? What is life about? Right? So, so we, we will argue. And we've also begun to silo the different disciplines. For example, um, I was at Mount Sinai studying medicine as an MD, PhD student, but very few of us who were all um, cloaked by the NIH, very few of us would be of that class. Most of the MDs are the ones that just um, see patients. Now, when I say just see patients, it's a huge amount of sacrifice. They're going to be seeing patients, but they're not going to be able to read papers, none of the latest and greatest. 
their time is. Oh, managing. I see where you're going They're with business. this. Yes. Mm. In other words, yeah. let me translate from mm. English to English. Uh, doctors don't have the time to read. Ah, yes, that's right. They they're either see the patients or they're writing grants, <laughs> but rarely Possibly, actually yep. reading the latest research. Yeah, no, it's they're a not very important read. point. Oh, yes, right. So, so lawyers are paid, to and read. and therefore they don't. Law- yeah. Right, writers are paid to read, and most, you know, but 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 doctors are not being medical doctors on the front lines are not paid to read. They're paid to see patients. So what happens is you have less reading, and who does the writing? It's usually scientists. And scientists and doctors don't have something that we have today, like Instagram, Facebook, um, and uh, LinkedIn, because those mm-hmm. platforms, LinkedIn is a business platform, Instagram uh, or Facebook is more of an entertainment type platform, right? Social media mm-hmm. platform. But doctors and scientists don't have the same platforms. Now, doctors go to conferences, the ones doing research, but the scientists doing other types of research, for example, I'm going to bring up a term. The term is called fomites, F-O-M-I-T-E-S. And fomites, if anyone sees the movie Contagion, would be able to understand what fomites are, the movie with Gwyneth Paltrow, because it is an object or a material that's likely to carry an infection that could include clothing, utensils, furniture, but also like surfaces that are porous, um, you know, like shopping boards, restaurants, you know, you have tables, surfaces, and those surfaces Mm -hmm. that carry these viruses allow the virus to live. Uh, What we've studied, and we've now gotten some more data on the coronavirus specifically, um, this is a SARS-like, it's almost, if you look at it, it's like a SARS-2, let's say, a SARS type 2. Mm Uh, so we already saw SARS type 1, now it's the SARS type 2. So it's a severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome. And how it acts is it, it, it really, it's almost like someone choking you, right? Suppressing your ability to have your breathing. To breathe. What? Hence the, uh, yes. the demand, you know, worldwide, actually, uh, for ventilators to assist in the breathing. Correct. Now, so this thing has a certain way of responding. It, it, it's invisible. So we cannot see it with our naked eye. All right. And it likes to be on these surfaces. And the medical doctors don't read the journals. Um, and the scientists don't talk to the medical doctors. They talk amongst themselves. And scientists don't even talk amongst scientists of different disciplines. Usually it's not a very interdisciplinary thing. So within your discipline, yes. you'll have your, your social media um, um, connections through your email or through conferences you go to and you have your connections. But you don't really, like, for example, a geologist is unlikely to talk to a virologist. That's just, you know, what, now, now is that a problem? So I am going to Yes, it is, actually. The, it is a problem. Right? <laughs> yes. Since yes. everything yes. is really one big system and holistic thinking is not just something relegated to a few individuals in the health field who do naturopathy or acupuncture or homeopathy or any such thing as that. It's truly the way the universe operates. And if the Hmm. interdisciplinary dialogue is not present, we're missing out. Your implication is clear, and I, I very much appreciate it. And, you know, overall what you're saying is you're giving us a bit of a lesson in uh, in how doctors get educated and what they miss as they're moving along in practice. And this is a very important point you're making, Dr. Chu, because most people don't think about that, and they attribute authority and expertise to places where it actually probably doesn't belong because the last time these doctors cracked open a textbook was when they were in medical school, and oftentimes that was 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. So who exactly are we listening to and why? And I think that provides a tremendously strong premise for what else you're going to be sharing with us. I have a little bit of a (laughs) prelude from you. Uh, But I I really think this is important because we're always having to challenge who it is we attribute authority to. Mm -hmm. And you've kind of set it up that we need to question. And I think that's incredibly healthy. I can feel my immune system getting stronger by the moment. 
Ah, so so I, I use the word fomite because it is, that's how they pronounced it in many, many cases. I, I once was in Singapore, and when I asked them um, to give me a bowl of soup, can I please have a bowl of soup? They couldn't understand what I was saying. Mitchell, you know, they in really? Singapore they don't use articles in their speaking. So oh. instead of may I please have a cup of soup, they would say soup now, soup soup. It was oh. something like that. So if you don't say it like that, yeah. people get confused. So I use the word. The Russians fomite. do the same thing, Gordon. The Russians ah, do that too. Yes, they drop so off. So fomite stuff in, in, in the movies <laughs> or in the cartoons and people they say, but it's actually pronounced fomites. F O M I T E S, oh. Fomites. Okay. Okay. Now, now that we have the correct definition or how to pronounce it, right? Uh, so, but I have to introduce it the other way so that perhaps through Google or people would find it. It is an inanimate object that can carry infectious agents. They can be pathogenic. They can be viruses. They can be bacteria. They can also be fungi. Okay. Now, an example, mm-hmm. good examples are always worth noting a stethoscope could be a fomites. A necktie could be a fomites that are associated with a healthcare provider, for example. So doctors have stethoscopes. Um, so a face mask. If, How about a face mask? Yes, a face mask could be as well, right, if it were got, got contaminated. So mm-hmm. the good part about face masks is there's many layers. But if you're going to wear a face mask, you should be trained on how to use wear a face mask. And... Uh, it doesn't take a very long time to, t- to, to train. But you, you should also wear gloves if you're going to wear a face mask because if you're going to have an itch on your mask and you need to scratch it, you, you probably will find it annoying to, um, to wash your hands for 20 seconds each time. So what you'll do is you'll probably use the back of your arm, your hand, and try to move the mask uh, to scratch the itch. And as a consequence, you've now exposed the mask. And you've increased the risk. So that is the so problem. So let me ask a question. With, if because, yeah. you know, we're starting to really get into the weeds here, which I really uh, very much appreciate, but I'd like to just take a little bit of a larger picture here, if we could, Gordon, just to say, uh, on one hand, uh, you've got surfaces that get contaminated with an encapsulated spiky virus. And from the surface, it can be inhaled. Is that correct? I mean, it is clearly airborne. I thought it so funny and odd, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about this, that uh, doctors have been talking about that it's droplet contagious. Well, in what medium are the droplets moving, if not through the air? So it can, to me, it was a, an utterly tissue dichotomy between being not airborne and airborne when clearly it has to be airborne. So maybe you could comment on that. And then I'd love for you to share with our audience a little bit about what you were sharing with me yesterday regarding the simple use of soaps for cleaning hands and cleaning surfaces for that matter, since it seems that this is a very important uh, matter and instruction for our audience, very practical, no pun intended, hands-on for people to be able to utilize what it is you're saying. Okay, so let me begin. I asked a lot by sharing. Uh, yes, <laughs> let me let me begin <laughs> by sharing um, what type of infrastructure we have as the United States of America. Um, for uh, we we've created IBM, we've created Google. We've created many, many things out of this country, which is why the United States of America is so great as a country, and we will be able to, um, to bring hope across um, viruses of this sort better than mm-hmm. um, most countries, most developed countries. Um, however, our fragmented mentality um, and uh, you know, the, the amount of resources that we apply towards various areas uh, creates problems. It, it, we, we become our own enemy in some ways. Um, first mm-hmm. of all, the funding that the CDC receives compared to a Merck or a Pfizer, which is where I came from, um, and, and, you know, or compared to the NIH, um, is, it pales in comparison for the magnitude of the task that's required. 
So would you mm-hmm. put Superman in some bunker instead of the Fortress of Solitude, right? Big problem, right? Would you put Batman mm-hmm. instead of in his well-equipped Batcave? He's in some house working it out of his garage, right? So I painted the picture for everyone, right? Yeah. And I want to, um, you know, really paint a, uh, a more of a cartoony type picture of what this virus would do or viruses that infect people do. Imagine it's like being bitten by a vampire and now you're infected. And what happens is you now need blood, so you go and bite someone else. You're not going to bite another vampire. You're going to bite someone else who's not been infected. And the virus really doesn't, is not as intelligent as you think like that. They just blast it all out and see what happens. So you're just going to be coughing everywhere. And the infected won't get reinfected while they're infected. But whether or not they get reinfected after they're better, the jury is still out. Right? So we don't yeah. quite know about this thing. It's a novel coronavirus. That's why it's so dangerous. And the only way we can really um, get rid of it, right, are some of the techniques that have been announced. One is social distancing, so shutting down the entire country. But if don't we live in a world, so don't, aren't there other countries? So if we don't all shut down at the same time, what happens, right? We have that issue. Sure. Doctors it's are all or nothing. To scientists. Sure. Right, all or nothing. By the way, right, so I just, for yeah. one moment, I would like to inject mm-hmm. one thing here. Uh, Sure. Here at A Better World, Gordon, we call it hmm. physical distancing because we hmm. need social rapport and closeness and intimacy more than ever, but we can't yes. do it physically. You know, so I just right. like to make that exactly. uh, point. We can be Wonderful. socially That's close, a great but physically distant. Yeah, thank you. That's a beautiful distinction because um, it's just like when people ask me about physically disabled individuals, I call them differently abled because they are differently yes. abled. Yes. They're not. They're, uh-huh. they're not disabled, right? So, so it's Correct. just a matter of definition. It's really true. So since you right, so since you brought up definitions, let's talk about the definition uh, in in virology about viruses, and viruses mm-hmm. are not deemed to be living. So you wrote a little bit about I tutor kids, and when I teach them for the biology SAT2 test or the AP biology test, we memorize that the viruses are not alive. However, the, the way the virus acts, right? Uh, the, right? So the way the virus acts, I think that it's more alive than some people who are, you know, around. They're more in life. They don't really, they're not as aggressive. They're not. Some they're of my close relatives. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, right. So, so perhaps our definition of what do you mean by it's not alive? So, so then when you look into it, they say it doesn't produce from cells. So that's the definition. But that's a, that's a dated definition. That's a dated yes. definition. The that's way it strategically attacks humans, right, or whatever species it now can attack, it's pretty living to me. And in fact, it's like a war. This means war. So we're going to, the virus is going to keep coming on heavy, and it even has the ability to mutate, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. But didn't I start off this, this show, this interview, by saying how powerful humans are? We're K-type. We invest in our, in our children. We have language and, and writings, and we have an, have an Internet that allows us to transport information. So we have yeah. the ultimate power. We're the only species that may leave this planet and discover exoplanets. So when you think about that, right, we can solve this problem. And this is what's important to get into is our ability to define things. Just like you were defining, if we properly define what the enemy actually is and list Mm -hmm. out five, ten things about the enemy, we will now understand. So back to the enemy. The enemy is invisible. The enemy and our solution right now is to wash our hands and to keep that physical distance, right? Wash our hands Mm -hmm. with soap. And the CDC, the World Health, and others have said, wash your hands with soap for 20 seconds, and all will be good. Two happy birthday songs. The problem Mm -hmm. we have is that they're right, but they were not thorough. Okay? They're right because the virus is fatty, right? It has a fatty Mm -hmm. outside encapsule. So when you take fat and put it in water, or you put oil and put it in water, um, what happens? The oil floats on the water. And so the mm-hmm. two cannot mix. And that's why when you wash your hands, if there's a virus, you've got, um, you've got a problem. So that's why you use soap. But now let me mm-hmm. describe the oil a little bit differently, like I talked about the vampires. 
So mm-hmm. imagine you have a piece of shit in your hand, okay? Fecal mm-hmm. matter. Now, it's a piece. So now wash your hands with soap. What's going to happen now? Well, you've taken out the first layer. Let's put some perfume in the soap, too, so it smells nice. But the moment you break the shit apart, okay, the inside of the shit will not be, will not be um, treated by the soap. Mm-hmm. So now what happens? The fecal matter now, and I made it very graphic, still contains the E. Mm-hmm. coli because the surface was treated. Now let's go back to the coronavirus. It has glycoprotein spikes outside. It is mm-hmm. through the spikes that the RNAs are injected into our cells through ACE2 receptors, and we don't, we don't want to go into all the details um, because that complicates things. However, yes. without the spikes, without the spikes, we're, we're good. pH 10 mm-hmm. soap will disrupt the spikes, and it will still allow it to emulsify so that the oil goes into the water. So it does everything that neutral soap does or soap does, but to be mm-hmm. specific at pH 10, making sure that we don't have surfaces that are contaminated because it is not the hands that are the issue, the sole issue. It's broader than that. It is the fact that if you're at a restaurant, you're in a bathroom, you're in, if you, have you ever had a restaurant where you drink a cup and you see lipstick still on the cup? All right, so if anybody's... Thankfully, no, there, not in my cup, but I have known ah. of such. Yes. Yeah, and right. And of so course, now, it's going would to you, happen. But it's just lipstick, so why don't we just drink from it? We can share cups, right? And then, but now we understand that if that lipstick was the graphic description I just gave you, you would not drink from that cup. What makes the, <coughs> what makes the virus powerful is that it's invisible. So now you can't even see the lipstick. And if you just push it around using neutral soap or soap you haven't really uh, determined is actually pH 10, now you have increased risk. And there's no risk if there's no virus. But there is risk right. if the coronavirus if is there. there. Is. Which, right. Right, and you can't see well, it. One of the uh, so, reasons I wanted to... Uh, have you on, Dr. Chu, is to talk about this kind of thing and to outline, if you could, a few items that our audience could take away with them and utilize. And one of the things I enjoyed so much in our conversation yesterday was that things as simple and inexpensive as Irish Spring Soap or Dove, yeah. or things uh, that are just on the ordinary uh, shelf at a grocery store or pharmacy, mm. uh, can go a far distance, such as even things like I've been hearing, and I'd love to hear what you have to say, of drinking warm, warm water throughout the day and remaining hydrated through that, or lemon water for that matter, keeping your hands clean, of course, keeping, keeping surfaces clean obviously these days uh physical distancing uh so you know um self isolation at this point you know there are a handful of relatively straightforward ways that people can do a lot to help themselves and help others by so doing another in another realm is uh the whole area of using um antioxidants and such antivirals as vitamin C. Even the cheapest ascorbic acid, apparently, uh, really does the trick as long as it's taken throughout the day. As you know, uh, Shanghai has officially recommended the use of, in this case, high-dose intravenous C, which they've been using in their own hospitals to great, great effect. So, you know, when you make things simple, and affordable and reasonable and doable for people, they do it. And you have a right. knack for bringing that forward with your analogies and images, etc. Some of them are a little colorful, by the way, <laughs> but I appreciate I learned that from last. being a New Yorker. Uh, I learned that from being a New Yorker <laughs> and right outside of this epicenter, right? You know, you have to be yes, a little graphic indeed. sometimes. Especially sometimes in you Italy, do, right? right? So, 
So my so friends over there, you know. On, <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. <laughs> yeah. If you could pick right. up on that kind of uh, meme, uh, that would be great. Sure. So you mentioned Irish Spring and Ivory, um, but you, you also mentioned Dove. So there's a distinction because different brands make different types of products. You have to mm-hmm. make sure that the soap you're using is pH 10. You get some pH paper from Amazon or you get it from a store. The and little you strips. Test it. Uh-huh. Yeah, the little strips. And you test it. And it so has in other words, you make some there. suds. You make some suds and you stick the strip into those suds. There's a crude way to do it. There's a laboratory uh, method to do it. Um, it's easy to tell. Um, you could put a piece of soap in a cup and dilute it 50-50 and check. And if you're worried whether or not you dilute it too much, dilute it again or set it up again where it's more concentrated. And you can see, you will see that it's a pretty solid test that when you test it out, the piece of soap. Now, I describe piece of soap because bar soaps are fairly reliable. They're made using sodium hydroxide. I'm being technical again. Um, and, um, and then what happens is, if you check it compared to, um, you know, sodium hydroxide, layman's term is lye, um, L-Y-E. So, so the liquid plumber is made of lye. Too, that's too much, by the way. It's pH 14. So you don't need it right. to be that do level. Do not you need drink the liquid plumber. Yes, do not do that. Um, the, what you need to do, you take a pH 10 soap, which is ivory, Irish ring, and then you compare that to liquid soaps, like um, from car wash, uh, detergents to uh, that you wash your car with to um, laundry detergents to um, dishwashing detergents you will find um, that many many liquid based products do not reach ten. Some of them are even acidic type soaps. Um, they're oh, salicylic my. acid laced soaps or psoriasis mm-hmm. and eczema. Uh, that, those mm-hmm. are very expensive, by the way, and they don't do the trick. You need the a surfactant. Thing. You need something that will emulsify the oil. Well, all soaps the water. generally do do emulsify, but you need a pH ten soap, which is basic enough that will invent the nature, which means ruin um, the protein glycoprotein spikes, which is how you you know that's the plug that comes into your cell and then um, and then and then and then distributes its RNA. So it cannot. It cannot mate with your cell. Let me just use a very, very gross That's definition. It's yeah. very broad. It will no, not it's not of, gross. Consummate, right? It your fecal consummate. matter description was more gross. <laughs> so yeah. you're oh, saying yeah. that it's the spike, and I, I'm just playing with you, but uh, mm. the spike into the cell is the transmission of the RNA substance, which allows for the multiplication. So if the spike is gone because of the soap, uh, which is emulsifying the the encapsulated uh, encapsulation, uh, you're in a sense almost free and clear. Yes, that's correct. Now, what's nice about this is every if everybody did this, right? Large masses of the population globally started doing this, then we would be back to order much quicker than if they didn't do it or they just washed their hands 20 seconds and, um, and didn't use pH 10 soap. So very simple. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't have to buy or compete with all that alcohol because bars of soaps are abundant. It's fast to make and it could be, sure. it could be, it could bring us there very quickly, all right, to a hygiene level that prevents this thing. We would be able to fight back with uh, the virus and push it back with a mega punch that is so powerful, it won't know what hit it. Now, for the patients Excellent. and individuals that are infected, that's a wholly different story. So key is to stay safe, physical distancing, apply that, but then to use this stuff to ensure that you don't do all that stuff and get infected. You wouldn't want to wash your hands 20 seconds with uh, a non-pH 10 soap and then suddenly still get infected because you touch some surface or other, or in fact, you, you're always washing your hands, but then someone didn't clean a surface with pH 10 soap, you touch it and now you're infected, right? So it's hard to be a hand Nazi or face Nazi so you're not touching your face because people, human beings touch their faces about 3,000 times a day. To change that habit requires a lot more than using pH 10 soap. So what you want to do sure. is you want to do something that everybody can get 
everybody can apply and use and increases the safety level so much so. Now, if you think you're going to get infected, or if, you, if you believe there's a possibility, you may want to change your diet. All right, you mm -hmm. may want to change your diet. Um, temporarily, mm -hmm. go back to what you want to eat later. But during this <laughs> high risk period... What are right, you recommending? Well, look at what the Italians ate, right? Um, now, now, the Italians had a lot of pasta as part of their diet. And you, most pasta is, uh, contains wheat and it's gluten-based. So the glue, mm -hmm. glue is, is, is gluey. So what happens is you, you, may, you may increase the, 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 um, the tax on the body. You may raise, you may lower your threshold to allergens, especially with the pollen season coming. Um, you, mm -hmm. you may want to cut out the gluten. And the other thing is anything that's an inflammatory. So we know what this virus acts like. It creates symptoms that are all aligned with inflammation, mm -hmm. all involved in inflammation. So when the immune system is better, highly functional, um, you can have two things. You can be hyperreactive to um, you know, that, histamines and things like that. You can be hyperactive because of the immune system. But, and at the same time, you could be a better detector so that you can knock out whatever it is. So it's a, it's a harmony and a balance that happens constantly, all right? So if you eat certain foods that push more inflammation, that same immune system is going to react in a sure. inflammatory type of way. Inflammatory way, exactly. Right. So exactly. you could take lots of vitamin C, which is very important, by the way, to boost the immune system. But then if you're taking lots of vitamin C and having lots of pasta, uh, eating a lot of tomatoes, tomatoes are a It's nitrate, going to so neutralize the uh, benefit and the effect of the antioxidants and the antivirals. Yeah. No, it's a good point. But underlying well, is what's the interesting, notion. Mitchell, is, um, yeah. What's yeah, interesting, no, I'll, I'll say is this, is that it doesn't cancel. Um, think about driving a car. Your, your gas pedal and your brake seemingly cancel each other, right? You know, so if you're, you want to accelerate, you use your gas pedal, you use your brake to stop. But what if you stepped on both of them at the same time? Do they cancel each other or does it break your car? Probably causes a problem, uh -huh. right? So, so, so if you Definitely. take vitamin C and then you, you, know, and you spend all this money to buy vitamin C um, and you do all these things and then you just, you just take a bunch of inflammatory things or do take a diet that's very pro-inflammatory, it's not canceling. It's actually um, damaging. It causes all kinds of issues because your immune system is now hyped up, right? So, so, so what I want listeners to think about is go to the vitamin C, read the journals and, and look at things, but at the same time, avoid tomatoes, avoid corn, avoid wheat, wheat right? And, and, and just eat other things. Um, and that mm -hmm. will dramatically be protective. Now, so, so you have to subtract the negatives and add the positives. That's basically a very simple thing, is that you take a list of positives, you add those. You take a list of negatives and you reduce those. So, uh, and a good example is someone who's taking elderberry, right? Because that's soothing for the throat. It's coating. Very good. Mm -hmm. At the same mm -hmm. time, what they do is they don't add olive leaf extract to their, to their, um, to their regimen. Right. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, so they're not adding that. So what happens is all you're doing is you're coating, all right? Now, yes. now the same Without person the now gets the virus. Right. So mm -hmm. we're going to paint a picture where this individual now gets the virus. They're taking elderberry. And, and they also smoke, by the way. So they're smoking and taking elderberry. So that's, well, you take a <laughs> negative, right? And you yeah. take a positive and you say, well, what happened? How come it didn't work? Well, you know, there's a problem. Now, if you then take the person who's smoking and say, all right, eliminate that, no smoking, just the elderberry, and they get the virus. And then you have their 400 pounds, okay? They're five foot, let's say they're five foot two and they're 400 pounds. And you say, well, it didn't work. Well, it's not that it didn't work, but you need to have something to help it, you know? And you might not even have at the threshold to see the benefits of the elderberry because of that. So you have, you have that. And then you take a person who's allergic, has a, an allergy to cats and, uh, and pollen. And the pollen season comes about and they go to some place where there's cats and they're taking elderberry and they say, it didn't work. Well, the elderberry is not going to be able to stop. And I'm going to use a little Einstein here. 
uh, and Newton, Newton laws, okay? So um, it says that uh, Newtonian um, uh, theory said this, if an object will keep going in a certain direction unless acted upon by an equal... A body in motion force, tends right? to stay in motion. Yes. Exactly. So, so I'm just using the Gordon definition because I want kids to remember it and people to remember it. So you push something, yeah. it's going to keep going unless it's cool an opposite push. Well, mm-hmm. so if you have sickness, you're going in one direction and you're going to stop it. You think that you're just going to stop it with an equal and opposite force, but it's not true. To be in a positive direction, because we want to go into the healing mode, you actually need a greater force in a greater direction because you're not just going mm-hmm. to stop it. Stopping means doing nothing, and it doesn't, you don't get sicker. But to go into positive, you need a greater yeah. and positive force, which is why right. that If you remain simple, mathematical about it, you end up in a stasis. And it's not true because right. nothing is in nothing is really static. Well, when you're so dead, it's stasis, uh, right? So, so that's where the well, Chinese well, maybe not uh, actually. Medicine. That's not necessarily <laughs> true. I mean, that may sound yeah. funny, but you know, you're decaying. You're yeah. Decaying. So, right. So something that's is motion. Not in, you're so becoming exactly. you're becoming so, fertilizer. Right. You know. Yes. Yeah. So the saprophytes are actually benefiting when you're decaying. Uh, meanwhile, you're not benefiting because you're not there, but maybe you are because. Perhaps there's a second life. Yeah, this is all very, um, very uh, arguable, and and that's exactly what gets people really riled up. Is that let's keep arguing about this because we found at MIT the virus can jump very high into the air. I think there was reports of 20 plus feet in the air, and so they'll, they'll spend lots of resources. Because remember, I worked in graphene, so we received trillions of dollars from multiple governments to work on this two-dimensional material. It was so fascinating. That for the next 10 yeah. years, all we would do is work on all the other fascinations that would come with it, but we never made it practical. So, yeah. so that is exactly how medicine is like. Because, see, um, you, you, everybody knows Dr. Fauci, right? So, so he's, mm-hmm. now, he's now talking about this, uh, and he's talking about how we need data. See, he's, very, he's a wonderful man, he's very good. And then you have the program. He's an academician. My programming. Well, my program was the same. I was programmed that we need enough data. We can't act upon some things uh, in, a, um, in, a, in a way that's clinical based on one patient, right? And then I met my match when I had my two children. Um, my two daughters, when I went through obstetrics, not studying obstetrics, but actually living through obstetrics, I realized that the um, OB-GYN, uh, was just acting based on how my wife was responding and how the fetus was responding, not based off of any uh, millions of data pieces because everybody's different. So there are disciplines within allopathic medicine that looks at individualized responses. And the faster we can get through that programming, the better we can now launch these studies because we have an entire um, and why that's, uh, I'm so hopeful is because we now, the FDA has just approved um, the cinchona plant, the tree, uh, bark, which helped this, um, this countess cinchona way back when in Spain when she got caught malaria. And they found that this toxicity, this plant is toxic, right? So that's what medicines, many medicines are. It, it increases the toxicity, and now the malaria does not want to infect the cell, well, the red blood cell. So now as a consequence, they have found, if you read your papers, that's been helpful from rheumatoid arthritis to other things, but also in China and other countries, they have found that it's been useful to actually stop the coronavirus from infecting the cells. Do they know the dose? So they have found they that, and that is documented? Oh, yes. 100% documented, just not documented with a million people or 100,000 uh, people in the trial. They haven't tested it like that because we, don't, we didn't have 100,000 people that were sick. And we, don't have and the, we, we haven't don't had the that. time to do that really either. But the point is, do you know how many people were tested and uh, had positive results so yeah, far? Yeah, so I'm going back to my daughter who was born. I only have one Gwyneth and I have one Gemma. They're very different. So, so we could only have that one example. So in China, they had like 10 people. 20 people, 30 people, some number that was grossly off from the millions or the hundreds of thousands that we are schooled 
to think about. Yeah. So that um, aside, so I'm not really that. interested in how you were schooled. Well, you know, with all due respect, I don't mean just you. I mean oh, thank you. the way the <laughs> field right. yeah. operates. Right. Okay, that to me right. is academic and really not directly relevant to the crisis with which we are dealing now. And so to say that there were 50 or 100 people that the quinine, the chloroquine was used with effectively is for people like you and I, I believe, and the audience, meaningful. We would just have to look at whatever possible downstream side effects there were, assess those, uh, look at dosage, look at any uh, possible um, adverse, you know, uh, you know, um, effects of, depending on, let's say, the state of the immune system, any other allergic potentials, blah, blah, blah. But other than that, you know, it could be something that we really go forward with. But I also want to say, I very much mm-hmm. appreciate your bringing that up, Gordon, because this is something that's very much in the news and very much newsworthy. But I'm going to go back to something as simple and inexpensive as vitamin C, aside from what you were saying of, uh, you know, the driving with the gas on and, you know, uh, and pushing on the brake at the same time relative to other inflammatory uh, foods. And I completely Mm. agree with you. Um, Just that aside, that aside, that should not Mm. be at all um, uh, impetus not to be taking rather copious doses of vitamin C. And it actually doesn't even have to be copious. It can be two to 600 milligrams a day spaced out over the course of the day so you're in a sense um, mimicking intravenous which of course nobody can do on their own but if you take it incrementally throughout the day it probably will cost a dollar a day add a little vitamin d to it add a little selenium and zinc to it and you've got a lot to build your immune system at the end of the day selenium that's uh brazil you know you know that um that's what now we've I'm got to... we've got our own yeah. immune system to continue to cultivate making the dietary recommendations you made are excellent and adding these simple supplements are enough quinine you know the use of that is to me additional and i think it could be a brilliant addition but what we've got today of what we know today we have the armamentarium if you will for dealing personally individually and in families across the country and the world enough to really arm ourselves well would you like you to think? have the, the fountain of youth formula? Okay, so I'm going to give it right. to our audience since they're, they're so nice and listening. And we have 100,000 people who have listened to the pH 10 soap already um, in Asia. Uh-huh. So it's constantly growing. Within That's five great. days, it's growing by, uh, should I by the Should I speak in down. Chinese now? I, can, I have to speak in Chinese only for them. But I'm going to say this okay. in English, all right? And it's going to oh, come okay. across uh, very simple, right? So the vitamin C is a check yes because it, it's just it's a very neutral thing it's benefiting and it's not going to hurt you the other thing is our cells require when we when we when our mitochondria and our life force in the cell uh, requires nad plus that's inside of the mitochondria so it's called the mm-hmm. electron transport ch- uh, chain and so we have found under um uh, dr um uh, leonard who's a phd in mit um, he, Leonard Guarenti, all right, uh, you know, G-U-A-R-E-N-T-E, look him up. And he mm-hmm. has found that, you know, you can actually um, pr- promote cellular health by having that. So that is in mm-hmm. So you may le- know about Reservatora. Uh, you may know about the NAD Plus sure. supplements. And so that sure. is, is a, if you combine that with your vitamin C, all right, to maintain yeah. healthy DNA, and then selenium. Excellent. What selenium does, okay, selenium is right underneath sulfur in the periodic table. And right above sulfur, right, sulfur is number 16. You subtract 8 and you get to oxygen. So oxygen is what life is about. So oxygen, sulfur, mm-hmm. and then selenium. They're all in the same yes. group. Selenium, if you plant 
uh, if you grow things and you add a little selenium to your to your garden, what happens is the the, the stems get really strong. So that's how plants use selenium, and that's what happens with them. If you put a little selenium on your hair, okay, a little selenium on your hair, that, my friends, are, that's selsin blue. Selsin blue. And what did selsin blue do? It gets the dandruff off, right? And you remember the commercials a lot? So selsin, selenium has a certain type of toxicity to, uh, and it's helpful for plants, and it's hurtful to fungus, all right? Helpful, hurtful oh. to fungus. What yeah. does it do for humans? Well, what does it do for humans? Humans yeah. who eat more plants, if they eat the right plants, not the ones that cause inflammation, it will enhance your entire vitamin repertoire. Okay? Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, those of you who listened to my first TED Talk, and I mentioned the individual name, Professor Thomas Nosker, he got sick with, he got infected, so he got COVID-19. He got infected with the coronavirus and expressed his COVID-19. And he took selenium, and he's alive now. Okay? Oh he worked my. with me personally. We were on the Great phone story. together. He was describing what had happened. And, you know, he, he was the one that helped me fuse graphene with plastic to get, we work together. And we were the first oh. one globally to combine graphene yeah. with plastic. So he got infected. All right? He got infected. Oh. His son was at a Biogen conference over in Massachusetts, got infected. Whole family got infected. And... He got infected. It's a box in the corner. He has little time to, to, to figure this out, but he is a material science individual, and he helped, and he actually figured out, and that's patent number 9896565, which has his name, my name on it. He gets infected, right? And he's telling me this, hmm. and he's telling me what selenium did for him. Live story, real stuff, cheap Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts will have enough selenium, two Brazil nuts, and you're good. So if you oh, start doing that wow. with NNM, Right with the Deveratrol, you're going to be. Um, uh, I don't know if you've done on your show uh, Resveratrol, right, um, uh, or the NAD plus NMN supplements. But I'm no, sure not a show on that, that explicitly, okay. but well, I'm, I personally yeah. am aware. Yeah, you're aware of this. So you take an NAD plus supplement, and see, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to read to you. It's a stilbenoid, right? Resveratrol is a stilbenoid. It's a, meaning it's a natural type of phenol, and it's produced by plants. When do they produce this? They produce it when they're injured. By, when, they're, when are they injured? They're injured by pathogens such as bacteria or fungi. So they produce this. Mm-hmm. We eat this thing. We ate the NAD+. The third plus. Role, of course, is in grapes, and that's why people say yeah. drinking wine is good for you. That's not exactly true, but what they're really referring to is the content of resveratrol, which isn't great right. in wine, but, of course, it's much better in grape juice or in other, you know, these days they're just simply extracting it and concentrating it into supplements. So, right. yeah, please so go So if on. you have that, oh, this is perfect. So if you have that and you don't get confused by the – by the, the fact that they're using that item to sell wine. And you, you, I like locate that material, and you get a supplement that has the NAD plus precursor, and you have this product R, you know, ingredient R, Reservatrol, and then you put that together with your regimen of vitamin C, with your selenium. Now, now and then you use the pH 10 soap. Now, you're, you're, you know, imagine if everybody did stuff like that, right? A little bit of this, a little yeah. bit of that. And we, we bounce back. We hit this virus with a bigger punch than ever, and we come, we go, life goes back to normal. And it was like it never happened. Yes. And at that point, nobody <laughs> will call me anymore. I like that. Right? So because yeah, we I like that. Everything will just be settled. And we prefer it that way. So I don't want people calling me and asking me what the solution is. I want you to be well. I want you to be safe. And I'm going to tell you that there's going to be another virus. Why? And it's because of the – remember we talked about scientists not talking to each other? We yeah, found, I know. We talked about of uh, I sent you the, the release link, right? of, of viruses due to um, intense global warming and uh, methane release and ice melt and the like. Not to and mention drilling, drilling when, cores, right? And drilling, and right? Earth. And uh, you made yeah. that point. It's an excellent one. Sure. It's well, disruptive. It's actually. extractive and it's disruptive to our beautiful Mother Earth. That's what it is. And we didn't ask the public, hey, you know what? We're going to go and drill on the uh, South Pole and North Pole. We're going to drill 50 meters down. Is it okay if we, 
if we might re- possibly release the virus? We didn't ask. <laughs> exactly. So, and we didn't bring exactly. other experts other than the people drilling, right, or people yep. looking at um, That's anthropology. Right. At, at epidemiological like that. issues that might arise, right? Mm-hmm. Well, viruses talk to one another. And so they, they, they even proved that they, they found that there's a dinosaur brain that they were able to bring up um, from, from, this, um, from the Antarctica. And this was in CNN. Oh. So if you look up um, the CNN article uh, that I sent you, um, that you'll, you'll then see that. Now, now if we also um, think about who was doing that drilling, were they, were, did they have any understanding of viruses and bacteria? No. So you get a little blood coming up there or some kind of stain, and you just brush it off. You let the, uh, the core drilling melt. Um, and now it's escaped into the air. It takes time to come back down, but we're traveling up and down there. And slowly but surely, these viruses talk to each other, bacteria talk to them. And they talk to each other in what sense? Ancient bacteria learn that, hey, the modern mm-hmm. bacteria, there's something called triclosan, uh, which is used to antibacterial soaps. They also know about antibiotics, and they start teaching each other. And let me show you something here. I used to deal with a dinosaur. T-Rex, I know how to deal with him. So now they, they exchange information. And I'm, again, mm. cartooning this thing. Um, yeah, and sure. um, making an entertainment, right, edutainment. And so, yes. so now they, they're, they're, they talk, and they start talking, and there's, they're, you, you talk to each other all the time as humans. And, and nothing ha- sometimes happens, and sometimes something great happens. And you love in the air, and then, and then you, you have a bat that shows up too. And then the bat virus now talks to this, uh, this other virus, and that's how we end up getting certain things. I'll tell you, in the United States, we don't really talk about African swine fever as much as we should be. The African swine mm-hmm. fever wiped out 40% of the pork population, the pig population for pork in China as of last year. The prices mm-hmm. of pork skyrocketed. Well, African swine fever, I like to abbreviate as ASF, um, is very unique because it began in the 1900s. And the year 1900, it, it affected Africa. Eventually, it made its way, it's now 2020, 2019, into China. So that was like, you know, almost 100 years, 80 years, and now it's all, you know, it's out there. Um, and, so uh, this and is a eventually separate, the way. this is a distinct uh, virus from the coronavirus, COVID-19. Well, what's very important, distinction and the non-distinction, is that this virus um, is not a single-stranded RNA virus. This virus is a double-stranded DNA virus, one of a kind so far that we know. There's probably mm-hmm. more. And um, mm-hmm. this virus has a vector. What is the vector? It has a friend, like, a, like an Uber driver. And so what it does is it, it uses this Uber driver known as the tick to transport. So when the tick bites, an infected tick in the insect world bites the, the pig, it can now transmit not just from pig to pig, but from pig to tick to pig. And now it's everywhere. And if you step on it with your shoes and it's in the soil, I'm just talking about the virus, no tick, and you jumped into a plane and then flew to the United States and then immediately went to a pig farm, you could now create the biggest catastrophe to our entire mm-hmm. pork supply instantaneously. Yep. So these types of knowledge, this knowledge, right? Knowledge is power, right? We, we, we need to be very cognizant of how these things transport each other and start thinking of ways, for example, don't let people who have walked on soil from wherever they go to, and you see when you come into the border, they ask you in the questionnaire, where have you been? Have you been to a farm? If you check yes, right, there will be consequences because then they need yeah. to take away your shoes, make sure you've got to be scrutinized in another way. I'd like to, yes. Gordon, come back to something because yes. we're really just about mm. out of time here. Uh, mm. I want to come back to um, the 20, 2020 and the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 mm. in particular, and look mm. at another area that has just emerged from a dear colleague of mine just uh, contacted me regarding uh, a choir in Georgia where before the rehearsal or performance, all was well. After Hmm. the performance, 
They're standing next to each other. They're singing. No one coughed. No one sneezed. But they all, a large number of them, it seems, ended up infected. So I was laughing earlier about the idea of droplets not being airborne. I mean, it's too silly for me to even think about. But what is now being said is that it is airborne, as though it weren't before. But here's the point. With it being airborne in the understanding that seems to be emerging, that means that droplets aside, perhaps, uh, people speaking in each other's midst, let alone kissing or what have you, just speaking and being close to each other, sharing the same breath, if you will, would be enough to cause infection. Do you have any comments about that? I would say it's possible. See, um, when you were chatting, it appears that it just happened in a very, in a very discreet, concrete way. That's why I wanted to get your, you know, direct opinion. Look, it's 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 invisible. The enemy is invisible. Exactly. So my documentary that was in 2009, the title of the documentary was "Germs: The Invisible Enemy." Anyone on YouTube could type that in. And in there, Mm -hmm. I interviewed. Mm -hmm. Um, Gary Schilling and others, and talked about what would it do to our supply chain, uh, some of this invisible enemy. And so how, how, how does it travel? It's invisible. So I don't know how it travels, but I know that it, it's very light, it's certainly very light, light as a feather, lighter than a feather. So it's going to fly in the air. And how high it jumps really depends on, doesn't it depend on the wind? It's not, it doesn't jump, it doesn't have legs, right? So when right. Mitchell, when I worked on um, at RPI Rensselaer, when I worked on uh, NASA, it was the Origins of Life program under Professor James Ferris. Um, it was yes. really, in layman's term, looking for aliens, right? That was called the Origins of Life, but we were looking for aliens. <laughs> and people asked me, did you find anything, All right? This was the year 1993. Um, yes. And, um, and 1993, What are you kidding me? <laughs> and I, and I said, an alien? <laughs> yeah, and I said, I said I didn't find anything, but between us, and if you're talking scientifically, I found something. It, it was an oligomer growth that happened based on different clay surfaces we did. We basically repeated the Ure Miller experiments um, in, that were launched in 1952 with surfaces that we believe existed on other planets with vanadium and other things that wouldn't be as high levels on Earth. So I would just add them into the mixture and then see, based on the amino acids, if they would grow um, into oligomers, uh, longer chain things. And so it didn't grow into a protein. The thing didn't come out and say, hello, hi, how are you? It didn't do that. So it's to, to make a long story short for interviews or other things, I said we didn't find anything. But we found something that would then lead me to, when I worked in graphene, to have the breakthroughs. My mind had been changed in the 90s to accept anything as possible. So when we look yeah. at the COVID-19 situation that you mentioned in the choir, I'm going to uh, uh, touche on the other side is there was a patient sitting in a dental chair and he, he didn't cough, but he, you know, he didn't look well and he had needed a tooth to be extracted. He had just been at an epicenter in Thailand um, and he's sitting in a chair and the dentist asked him, have you ever been to a place where other people were infected? And he said, no, that dentist is now infected in Thailand. So mm. this is a, a public report release. People are not particularly lying about it, but they might not remember, or they might not be thinking about it in the same way. So or they may not be aware. How would right. you know? So I mean, if you really think about right. it, most people haven't been tested worldwide, let alone in the epicenters of our world. So the question is, in a sense, a naive one. Have you been in a place where there have been infections? Who knows the answer to that? You're not, it, it's not a, uh, an edifiable answer that would be coming forward, you know? So it's, right. it's, it's lax no matter how you look at it. I want to, I, I so appreciate, Dr. Chu, all that you have shared with our audience today. It is very rich information, oftentimes 
wonderful al- uh, analogies and images and uh, a humor inside of almost each one of them, each one of those droplets, and I really appreciate it. I want to I want to bring us one more step, though, before we completely conclude that I think has not been given proper place, which is in general, I don't mean just in this conversation at all, uh, and that is the role of our emotions and our minds in the whole game of inner strength, inner confidence, inner belief, hope, and the building of our own immune system with words, with language, with energy, passion, with love, with self-respect, for love of life. And when you begin to utilize words, and I know you know this very well, when you use certain words in a certain inwardly congruent and coherent way, mental coherence and heart coherence, you get a powerful message being delivered to the immune system because the immune system knows language and responds constantly to language, it fortifies it. And along with the vitamin C and along with the pH 10 soap and along with I'm gathering from you masks and gloves, along with all of the very useful um, recommendations you've made in today's show, along with Uh, what I'm saying here, one becomes inwardly equipped in ways that are within our control. And one of the issues that is circulating everywhere is, and if people watch too much television, they're going to get caught up in the media fear frenzy. And that is deleterious to the immune system. It is deleterious and and detrimental to the mind, and it's a form, honestly, of poison. So I just wanted to share with everybody that we have a lot more control over this matter, and you, thankfully, have been very much supportive of that idea, and I appreciate it. And it doesn't mean we're going to win every single time, no matter what. That's naive. That's not the point. The point is, let's do what we can within our purview to make a difference in our lives and others. And that's where we've become life-saving, perhaps for ourselves and for others. So I'm going to give you you a word of support there. I am bound to be hopeful by my first book, which is The 11 Steps to Quality Skin. It was written in Chinese Uh all over Asia. And the very first step was the mind. The mind. Uh-huh. And so the foods, the reason why we don't want Maybe to Maybe it should have been the first step, but yeah. Yeah, the no very first what, step I is understand. the mind. How are oh, you? Oh, I'm sorry. What yeah. is going on inside the head? You know, what's inside your head? How are you feeling? And how can you feel better? If you're nervous, your cortisol level goes up. There you, you go. You burn more nutrients um, inefficiently. You have less oxygen. Not, right. And so you're, there's greater confusion. So as a consequence, you're going to be less efficient. And if you have a student that's more nervous taking a test, they oftentimes misread the question. So if they misread the question because they're nervous, you, there are things that can help the calming. Now, the exactly. kajaput, what are you aware about the kajaput tree? No. The kajaput tree um, is a melaleuca leucodendron. And what this tree will do, um, it, it's, an, it's an oil, um, it's, a, a, it's from the Australia regions. And this oil Mm -hmm. can be helpful to break up phlegm inside of the lungs, but it's also very calming when combined with things like lavender, right? So you can combine them and and make this. So there's a lot of things is the more we understand how the whole body works and then apply the physics, the chemistry, the biology, the fundamentals Mm -hmm. to it, then we can then justify. Now, Cajaput oil is also anti-infectious. So one of the things we've been finding in these terpenes is that it, from these particular trees, including the, some of the stuff we mentioned earlier, is that it's therapeutic when you use the whole plant because sometimes it also has not only um, anti-infectious to the germs, but it also has the calming effect. You'll often see them coupled together. And that uh-huh. gives me a deeper appreciation for right. what you just mentioned, the mind. Because holistic mm-hmm. practitioners 
are looking at clinically what they have seen exactly. in patients. But when you look at the scientific understanding between the psychology of what is going on and the psychiatry and the medicines that drive that, and the it biology. all makes sense. Mm-hmm. And the biology. That's it right. all makes sense. That's Plants right. aren't getting COVID-19, are they? So, you know, you say, well, why is that? Do the plants help us? Which plants, though? And you have to understand the difference between the plants that are positive, exactly. and you also have to set yourself up. You have to set your life up, your body up, to be well. That's exactly right. Those are wise mm-hmm. words, Dr. Chu. I very much appreciate your perspective and your contribution to, well, if I may coin a phrase, creating a better world. So, she, she, yeah. I very much appreciate all of your contributions here. And in general, I, I'm, I'm so enjoying of, of your overall contributions all the way to graphene. We'll have to do a show on that sometime as well, too. So uh, you want to give your website or do you want to give any identifying information? So if people would like to follow up with you, they may do so. I have an Instagram that I set up in February. It now has 20,000 followers. I did this specifically for the COVID-19 so people could be informed. Um, it is Instagram.com slash forward slash Dr. Gordon Chu. So D-R and then G-O-R-D-O-N-C-H-I-U. Um, people can reach me that way. Um, you can definitely Google me on the Internet, and I'm not hidden. The people can locate me. Um, and... Um, and the final word is a greeting that was said, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, namaste. So, so I hope that everybody stays safe, they stay well, and, um, and we will get through this together. Beautiful. She, she. I really appreciate all of your contribution, as I said, and uh, we'll have you on again. Thanks again. Gordon. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you. Sure. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye, Bye-bye. now. Bye-bye. Dr. Chu, uh, with a vast body of experience behind him and knowledge and uh, a little playfulness and humor to go with it, which is just the spice of life we need from someone who is as really scientifically based as he is. It's a a very impressive background that he has and a lot of fun for me because uh, I don't have a formal background in science, but I believe we're all scientists and we're all artists. So when you put these together, you have a good human life. So I want to thank all of you for listening in today. I hope that was as interesting to you as it was to me. I got a great education. And know that you can contact me at A Better World. Uh, Please join our community uh, going to www.abetterworld.com. Dot TV and join our weekly newsletter. We're on television here in New York City, in Manhattan, every Monday night at 7 p.m. You can watch directly on TV or through our website at that very same time. It's webcast, and uh, so love to have you join in. We have guests, the sung and the unsung heroes of society who are making a difference in the world on the TV show as well. We've been on for many years and are glad to have you join us and our community. Also, if you are interested in stress management and coaching services or computerized kinesiology, all of those are other hats I wear here at A Better World. Contact me at 212-420-0800. That's 212-420-0800. Or by email mjr at abetterworld.net. That's mjr, my initials, abetterworld.net. And let me know of your interest. I will have uh, myself or someone get back to you, and we would go from there. Remember also that we are a nonprofit. We are a 501c3, and we so appreciate any donations. It helps keep us sustained on the air. So uh, your interest in that as well is so appreciated. I want to just say again a thank you, big thank you to Dr. Gordon Chu, who I have just become so fond of. He's doing a, a yeoman's job in educating young people and everyone. Uh, about uh, the COVID-19, but not just that, about uh, thinking about our lives in general in very practical, simple ways with a historical perspective, and I think that's great. I also want to give a shout-out 
since the subject has been all about COVID-19, to the heroes of our society who are on the front lines in our hospitals and our clinics across the country and across the world, people who are risking their lives, literally, for helping others. And as well, by the way, all the people that are uh, just also very much in the world right now doing what they're doing uh, to help serve to the postal service, for instance, uh, you know, and all the people that continue to do this good work everywhere that keeps the wheels of our society spinning. It's uh, truly garbage men. Everyone is doing, people involved in uh, Con Edison, the electricity and water and it's remarkable how people really do get it and help each other out over and over again. And it's just part of our, I believe it's part of our biology, quite honestly, but it's also part of our psychology. And uh, I just want to acknowledge all the people that are helping to keep this world going under such extreme conditions in which we're currently living. And as Dr. Chu said, Keep hope alive. We are getting through this. It's We are probably entering the time of starting to flatten the curve. I wish that we had more real leadership from on top. I don't think we're getting it. I don't think we have gotten it from the beginning, and we're not getting it now. They're fumbling. It's sad. But nonetheless, people are still coming forward and doing wonderful things on the state levels, on the city levels, governors, mayors across the country and the world are really taking matters into their own hands. And it's up to us to follow the guidelines that Dr. Chu and I have enunciated in today's show. And by following these guidelines, uh, both from the physical distancing and the washing and the surface cleansing and the supplement regimens and the mindset, we're really going to get through this swimmingly and sooner than later. So on that note, I just thank you all for tuning in and being part of our larger community. Take this interview and send it to your friends. There's a link on our website a better world TV under radio archive and uh, let people know that there really is a lot we personally can do without relying on others or relying on vaccines or drugs or anything like that. Just personally, inexpensively, things can be done. So on that note, this is Mitchell J. Raven for a better world. Thanks again for listening. And I look forward to seeing you all next week.